Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us either this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you're at in, in the world right now. Uh, this is the Emerging Leaders session. Um, and we are fortunate to have four young speakers with us today. Uh, Coral Avery, Tyler Everett, Val, Val Holly Frank and um, Jasmine Neosh. And um, my name is Kelsey Morales. I am currently on the traditional homelands of the Kootenai, the Bendon Oriel, and the Bitterroot Salish tribes in Whitefish, Montana. Um, I'm with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals in the Tribes and Climate Change Program. And we are also supported today by William Warner. So that is who you'll be hearing from today. And to get us started, um, I'd like to ask everyone either, so in the chat, to just reflect on what the most meaningful um, or impactful experience, job, or work that you've done so far in your life, um, and how that's led you to, to where you are at today. Um, it's a small session, and so we definitely want, we want to hear from you, and we want this to be a really meaningful conversation between the panelists and, and those in the audience. So just want to hear a little bit from you. Where are you joining us from, and, and what work life experience has been meaningful to you um, in terms of where you're at today. And we'll read some of those out as soon as they come through. Yeah, the so the prompt is actually on the screen right now. Um, so just, just wanting to hear from the audience, you know, as since this is the emerging leader session, um, you know, these folks have had many experiences that have led them to where they're at and hopefully where they're going in their climate adaptation, climate related um, fields. And, and so just wanting to hear from you, you know, where, you, where you've come from and what's been the most meaningful or impactful for you in your career so far. Yeah, and so I think, um, We'll go ahead and uh, keep an eye on that chat. And um, thanks, Dina, for kicking us off. Uh, Dina says, I think every job I've ever had has been a meaningful experience to me in so many ways, each one with its own lessons to teach me. So hopefully folks will, their responses will trickle in there and I encourage you to check that out. And um, so basically this panel is structured in a way that you're going to hear from each of the four panelists, and then we'll kind of go into a discussion. So they'll give a brief overview of their work, and then we'll dive into some questions that, that we've come up together um, with, and then also hearing questions from the audience here. So I'm going to go ahead and switch presentation which presentations here and um, we'll, our first panelist that we'll hear from is, is Coral Avery. So please give a virtual applause for Coral and um, yeah, excited to hear what, what they have to say. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here at the Shifting Season Summit. I was definitely surprised when I got an invitation to speak um, at this event and the other speakers and, and panelists and everyone have been amazing. So I'm glad to be here. Um, today I'm going to share a little bit about my experience as an intern through the Bureau of Indian Affairs Pathways Program and the work that I did uh, with the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, and Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Next slide. So a little bit about me. I'm a Shawnee tribal citizen. I'm from Southern California in Kumeyaay lands, um, where I grew up in suburban and rural San Diego County. And I'm now located in uh, the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, um, where I recently graduated from Oregon State University as a first-generation college student. 
I was also a transfer student to OSU, um, where I first went to community college, both in San Diego and in Portland, um, and graduated in December as class of 2020 uh, with a double bachelor's in human dimensions of natural resources and sustainability. And I found out about this internship experience uh, through a professor that I actually barely knew. They, they reached out and um, asked if I was interested in an opportunity. I got my application in quick and uh, was excited to kind of learn on the fly about what the program was about. Next slide, please. So I was accepted for the Rangeland program for the BIA uh, Pathways program. It's open to any uh, students who are members of a federally recognized tribe in the United States. I had a pretty delayed onboarding process, um, but was placed to work with the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians in the summer of 2019. And they're the closest tribe uh, to campus here at Oregon State University. Um, I also had the option to work either with my own tribe or with another uh, regional tribal organization, uh, like I now work with uh, at and So during my time in Siletz, I worked in tribal forestry and healthy traditions where we focused on gardening, uh, traditional food revitalization, um, and did a lot of work out in the forest doing stand surveys, road surveying, um, inventory of different plant species that were found in the area. Um, and I got to tour some of the facilities uh, in town there, which was a really gratifying experience. Next slide, please. All right, so last June, I started my internship with both the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians and Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, because of COVID, everything that I've done since then has been virtual. So it was a very different experience than getting on the ground field work uh, like I did in Siletz. A little bit about at and um, We're a regional tribal organization that was established in 1953. It's comprised of 57 member tribes uh, from, excuse me, Southern Alaska uh, to Northern California and east, as far east as uh, West Montana. And we have three main programs of climate change, natural resources, and energy. So I've been based in the climate change program there, uh, working primarily in youth programs uh, as the youngest, current youngest person on the team. Some of the projects that I've been involved with have been digital marketing. Uh, I came up with an idea for an indigenous youth video contest uh, that was I think really amazing and probably one of my favorite experiences with at and so far. Uh, we also had a video storytelling workshop where we partnered with the university. Um, and we've been planning the National Tribal Leadership Climate Change Summit, uh, which is ongoing. We have our fourth session coming up uh, in a month or two, both for our main track event, which is open to all generations, uh, tribal, non-tribal, and a youth-specific summit series um, that I've been co-organizing that is uh, focused for indigenous youth specifically. We also have a tribal climate camp that we've been working on organizing, which has unfortunately been pushed back due to COVID, but we're really excited um, when the time comes for that to be appropriate to host. I've also been writing reports and papers, including the status of tribes and climate change, um, an Oregon climate report and a brief paper on decolonizing federal land management. Uh, one of the biggest ongoing projects I've been a part of has been compiling a database uh, based on the priorities listed in regional tribal vulnerability assessments. So all of that work was pretty new to me other than event organizing. Um, I've definitely learned a lot during this internship experience. Next slide, please. And then we can skip over this one, but this was an example um, of a video that I made for the Indigenous Youth Video Contest. Um, it also won some awards from the Hybel Cultural Center's um, annual film festival. And we featured all of our videos throughout the uh, summit series that we've had at AT&I. Next slide, please. 
Please excuse my cat in the background. <laughs> she always makes an appearance at meetings. Um, a couple of the standout moments were the video contest. Um, the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center also featured me as uh, their August spotlight. Um, and I've had a lot of opportunities that have opened up since being an internship, uh, or excuse me, being an intern for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, I was contracted to organize the Portland Youth Climate Summit. I had my first publications, uh, scientific publications, and I've spoken at a number of events, including um, this summit series. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, we have our upcoming summits. So you can check out more information uh, on that on our website. Next slide, please. And then beyond my Pathways internship, I just recently transitioned from an intern to um, the quote unquote professional <laughs> employee. So I now have an interagency agreement between the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, and the USGS Climate Impacts Group, where the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center is based out of. Um, and I began just last week, where I work about 60-40 between the two agencies. And later this year, we'll be moving uh, to Seattle, again, um, COVID willing, to work out of their office uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. Oh, sweet. And through the BIA work, um, I am focused on ensuring that grant funding opportunities are accessible and worthwhile for tribes. Um, it takes a lot of capacity okay. to apply for grants and find those opportunities. Uh, so making sure that that's accessible has been a really important uh, piece of my work with the BIA. I'm also continuing to compile that database of priorities based on the vulnerability assessments and working with partner organizations and through the Northwest Cast, I'm excited to be um, identifying new funding opportunities for tribes, uh, supporting the USGS in their efforts to directly fund tribes and promote tribal sovereignty, um, which is something that they've been pushing, at least in the Northwest, um, I'm sure other regions as well, been pushing for a lot more uh, in recent years. And then also continuing connections uh, with both tribal and non-tribal agencies and organizations. Next slide, please. So to summarize, um, I had a lot of previous experience that helped me get to uh, this internship in the first place, but my internship through the Bureau of Indian Affairs was incredibly rewarding and opened a lot of new experiences. Um, I especially didn't think I would be working at all with things like um, grant reviewing grant proposals um, or working too much on scientific papers, but it's opened up a lot of ideas for new interests and has also been an avenue to further some of my other uh, hobbies and interests like event planning and um, art and digital media. So I've really enjoyed the opportunity and look forward to the way that um, my new position past the internship uh, can continue to balance all of those interests and passions um, and help tribes in all of the amazing resiliency work um, and climate adaptation work that is underway. Thank you so much for having me present today and I look forward to hearing from everyone else. Thanks so much, Coral, and congratulations on your new position. That's very exciting. Um, Coral, if you want, um, feel free to put some of the links that you shared in this presentation for the Tribal Leadership Climate Summit and also that video you put together. It's an amazing video um, if you haven't seen it. So feel free to drop those links in the chat for other folks to uh, check out here. Perfect. And, and I'll drop that in the chat um, on the website and not in the in the Zoom chat. So if folks are on Zoom, make sure to look at the chat on the on the main website. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And then with that, we'll go ahead and transition to our second panelist, Tyler Everett. Sorry about that, pulling up the slideshow. Yeah, no problem. There we go. Everyone seeing that? Yeah, it looks great. Thanks, Tyler. 
So, Wabanoke uh, Week, Mi'kmaq. I'm a person of the dawn. I'm Mi'kmaq. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, my name is Tyler Everett, and I'm a citizen of the Aroostook Band of Mi'kmaqs. I am the Forest Adaptation Technical Assistant uh, with United South and Eastern Tribes. I work really closely with Dr. Casey Thornbrew. I'm sure a lot of folks on the call have worked with him. Um, I really enjoy working with him. Uh, we work closely with the Northeast and Southeast um, Climate Adaptation Science Centers uh, under the Department of the Interior. Uh, United South and Eastern Tribes, also known as USET, is a nonprofit intertribal organization representing 33 federally recognized tribal nations. Uh, USET works to support tribal nation governments and provide technical support and services to tribal programs. Uh, USET was founded in 1969 from four founding tribal nations, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Um, at the time of USET's inception, it was really a serious challenge for tribal nations to go individually and advocate for the U.S. and states to deliver on their trust and treaty obligations. So here at USET, the approach of tribal nations coming together has been really foundational to the organization and a lot about its inception. Uh, so our motto is because there is strength in unity. Um, I'm really happy to be at USED. I really enjoy the work I do and, and the people I get to work with. Um, today, there are 33 federally recognized member nations within the USET organization, uh, where we have the mission of enhancing the development of federally recognized tribal nations improving the capabilities of tribal nation governments uh, and assisting tribal nations in dealing effectively with public policy issues. You can see the different branches of uh, the USET organization in the bottom left here. Uh, we're in the Office of Environmental Resource Management in the uh, cr uh, Climate Resilience Program. Uh, on the right, we have a couple of photos. Uh, at the very top is uh, the tribal leaders of the founding, uh, four founding nations of the USET organization. Uh, the middle photo is the USET Board of Directors, uh, which are the tribal leaders for the 33 federally recognized tribal nations. Uh, and then the bottom is USET staff. Uh, we've grown since this uh, photo. I'm actually not in that photo. Uh, so hopefully once we can get back in person, I can get in a group photo. Um, the map in the middle is, uh, there's a dot for each of the uh, tribal um, headquarters for each of the 33 federally recognized tribal nations. And then above that is the USET logo. Um, in the center of the logo is the Council Oak, uh, which is really culturally significant to the Seminole Tribe of Florida. It's where um, tribal leaders would meet and tribal citizens would meet for uh, ceremonies and tribal meetings. Uh, it's still used today and is on the Hollywood Reservation. And then all around the Council Oak are uh, peace pipes for each of the 33 federally recognized tribes, uh, tribal nations of USET. Like I said, I'm in the Office of Environmental Resource Management. Uh, this branch of USET was founded in 2004 to assist member tribal nations in addressing environmental concerns like the cleanliness of water, uh, health and community ecosystems, uh, climate change and its impacts to tribal nations, where a lot of my work focuses, and then preserving and protecting traditional practices and public safety. Uh, the photo on the top left is the USET OERM director, Jerry Perdilla. Uh, Jerry's a citizen of the uh, Penobscot Indian Nation and a former chief for the Penobscot Indian Nation. I um, often find, oftentimes find myself getting lost in conversations with Jerry. He's a very easy person to talk to, and you can talk for hours. Uh, to the right of that is uh, an event that I hosted at the University of Maine, uh, where I brought a bunch of tribal foresters and natural resource staff, um, as well as some traditional basket makers and harvesters uh, to talk about emerald ash borer, some policies surrounding emerald ash borer, uh, and an inventory protocol that I developed. In the bottom photo is uh, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Casey Thornbrew here on the right, uh, on a site visit to the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. A lot of our work uh, sometimes brings us to uh, the headquarters for our uh, member tribal nations to talk about projects and get some on the ground experience. Once COVID's over uh, or 
everyone's vaccinated and we can resume travel, I hope to get to meet a lot of those folks. Uh, specifically in the Climate Change Resilience Program, we work to assist tribal nations with climate change adaptation planning, as well as connect tribal nations with uh, resources at the regional climate adaptation science centers. Uh, we work closely with the Northeast and Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Centers. Uh, we also work to support tribal adaptation planning and resilience to climate change uh, through assistance in developing climate adaptation plans and vulnerability assessments. The climate change team consists of myself right now and my supervisor, Dr. Casey Thornbrew. Uh, Casey is the uh, program director and the Northeast and Southeast Tribal Climate Science Liaison. Uh, this is the uh, USET region, starting uh, up in Maine, all the way down to Florida, across the Gulf Coast into Texas. So it's a really large region. Um, for the, the climate adaptation science centers that we work with, that, that includes the footprint for the Northeast Cask and the Southeast Cask. I'm actually a graduate fellow of the Northeast Cask. I saw uh, Brian Yellen on the call, and so shout out to, to Brian and any other fellows on the call. And then we also work with the Southeast Cask, and then because the USAT region extends down here, um, we also work with the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, April Taylor is the Tribal Climate Science Liaison there. A lot of the work that I do um, seems to come back to invasive species. Um, I'm really uh, focused in on emerald ash borer, but um, as I've worked in this position, I've gotten to work with tribal forestry and natural resource staff and a lot of other invasive species issues and other climate adaptation issues. But uh, in the photos here, in the bottom left is a, an event that was put together by a PI of the Northeast Cask, Tony D'Amato. Um, there's a lot of tribal uh, natural resource staff, um, traditional basket makers and harvesters in the photo as well. Um, it was a brown ash colloquium. You know, brown ash is a culturally significant species as being threatened by emerald ash borer, uh, the invasive forest pest that I'm sure many of us know about here on the call. Um, having started in the lake states, it's um, spread rapidly here to the Northeast and with its arrival in Maine, um, a lot of my work is focused on, on coming up with solutions and talking with folks on, you know, what's the response of tribal nations here in Maine <clears throat> and across the Northeast. Uh, in the center is a photo of uh, the forester for the Penobscot Indian Nation, or one of them, Seneca Stevens, looking at a, an infested uh, bolt of, of ash wood. And then on the right is some, some blonding, uh, a symptom of emerald ash borer activity on, a, on an ash tree. So uh, as, as you might have put together, a lot of my research has focused on emerald ash borer. Um, I'm actually only a part-time employee for USET. Uh, and the other part of the week, I might be wearing a Passamaquoddy forestry hat or be buried in the books um, working on my PhD at the University of Maine. Um, a lot of my work uh, started uh, in collaboration with the Passamaquoddy Forestry Department. I was working with the, the forestry department and, the, and talking with community members and tribal citizens. And there was a lot of concern about emerald ash borer. Um, and I just was shocked at how many folks knew not only that emerald ash borer was you know, knocking on the door, but what it could do, um, the impacts it might have on this cultural resource. And there's just a lot of passion and just brief conversations in passing. Um, then I tapped into the Brown Ash Task Force, which is a group of basket makers, uh, harvesters, uh, tribal natural resource staff, state and federal agency representatives, uh, and university and academic researchers, uh, all focused on how to protect brown ash. And just a lot of passion in the same room. Um, that's been really what's driven a lot of the work that I've done. In the bottom left is a, an inventory manual that I developed specifically for brown ash wetland forests. In the top right is uh, that same event I talked about earlier. Uh, this is the vice chief of uh, my tribal nation, uh, the Aroostook Band of Micmacs um, that I'm a citizen of, uh, chief, uh, Richard, uh, Vice Chief Richard Silliboy. Uh, he's peeling away the outer cambium layer of this ash log, trying to expose EAB larvae. Um, 
fortunately, we didn't find any on this this uh, peeling event, but uh, we, we didn't expect to. It was just uh, a bit of a, a demo and demonstration. And this is some of the inventory work on Passamaquoddy tribal land that's still ongoing to, to try to find these ash stands before emerald ash borer arrives. A lot of the work that I do for USET outside of working directly with tribal natural resource staff on climate adaptation plans is updating the USET webpage. Uh, we post current news and stories, uh, funding opportunities, upcoming events and webinars uh, similar to this one. This was certainly advertised on there. Um, some of our upcoming events like the Tribal Climate Camp uh, here in the USET region is going to be virtual, unfortunately, but uh, there may be some in-person components down the line. Uh, we try to update this webpage monthly, so it's a great thing to uh, circle back to and, and check out from time to time. Uh, we also have a, a second webpage that we've developed where we put a bunch of climate change tools and resources and publications, all of which are useful to, to tribal natural resource staff working to develop climate adaptation plans uh, in, in vulnerability assessments. Uh, those are broken down by, by state and tribal specific tools. Uh, it's a great resource and we're still working on it. So if you, I'll, I'll put both of the, the links in the chat. Um, if you guys take a look and have some suggestions, certainly reach out. Um, I'll, my email will be on the last slide. So, uh, well, Ali, thank you. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time for letting me uh, participate. Thank you to the Shifting Seasons Planning Committee. I know this is a, a challenging virtual conference to put together and it's been really great to be a part of so far. Uh, so thank you and uh, I'll pass it off to the last presentation. Thanks so much, Tyler. Yeah, feel free to put some of the, the links that you mentioned during the presentation in the in the chat box. And uh, yeah, appreciate all, all the work that you're doing. So um, Thanks. yeah, if we, let's see, Val Holly, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, that'd be great. Kendama, my name is Val Holly Frank. I am the daughter of a Seminole Tribal Board Rep uh, and a Panther Clan member, Joe Frank, and a, the environmentalist, Rhonda Roth. She works, she did a lot of stuff in the Northeast, um, but now she works mainly in South Florida. Um, I'm a Seminole Tribal member, and I'm also a plaintiff on the Reynolds versus the state of Florida lawsuit suing the state uh, based on the fact that they are not doing enough about climate change um, and also that they are actively contributing to it by allowing fossil fuels in our state. Um, I've been a lifelong climate activist with my father being a forester and my mother being very much into environmentalism. Um, and I'm just gonna scroll through and show you some pictures. Um, I've always been into environmental issues and social justice issues, um, but my climate work more so uh, I got into that more when I was around 15. Um, but even as a kid in like middle school, I was focusing on like light pollution and different uh, things that are affecting the people in the state of Florida. Um, and of course that has become more widespread with climate change. Um, but I've always been very into all of these environmental issues. Uh, this is a picture of me actually working out in a little tourist trap we have on our reservation. Uh, I lived on the Big Cypress Reservation for many years. Um, my dad still lives there. I live in town so I can go to school. Um, but I worked there uh, over the summer. I'm trying to work there again. And I just wanted to highlight this because the Big Cypress Reservation is just such an important part of my life. As, aside from just being born there and growing up there and even like having a job there, um, that's where our native medicine plants are. That's where we hold our ceremonies. Um, that's where so much of our community lives. We have a few different reservations around, like Tyler mentioned, the Hollywood Reservation where the Council Oak is. Um, there are reservations in places like Tampa, Brighton, just different places in Florida. Um, but I grew up on the Big Cypress Res and that's where a lot of my climate work is centered 
because of how important it is, uh, not just because it's in the Everglades, but also culturally and just to our peoples in general. I've been doing climate work for many years now. Uh, a lot of it, aside from being focused on indigenous resilience, is also based in Miami um, in places like Broward. That's the uh, county that I live in. Um, and I attend a lot of protests and rallies and I speak and um, I just sort of try to, to raise awareness. I try to bring an indigenous voice into these usually not very native spaces. Um, Cause I find that a lot of the times I feel like uh, people don't really remember that indigenous people still exist. There's so many people who talk about us like we're extinct, like they still see us as like this facade of like Pocahontas being saved by John Smith or whatever. Um, so I really like being in these spaces and being able to share that like we're still here and we are still trying to protect the earth that everybody keeps trying to rip from us. Um, as I mentioned previously, I am on the Reynolds v. Florida lawsuit, and that is a lawsuit saying that the state is contributing to climate change based on fossil fuels. Um, a few of the effects in Florida um, are like sea level rise, especially during the king tides in Miami. Um, there'll be like fish and octopus in the streets just like randomly and people just sort of accept it. Um, and it's of course going to get worse as the climate uh, gets more extreme. There are a lot of extreme weather events, worsening hurricanes, worsening storms in general, and also saltwater intrusion, which can really damage the lands. And if that wasn't enough, there are now oil companies trying to come into these reservation lands. Um, I attended a protest just a few weeks ago against uh, the Burnett Oil Company because they're trying to come in and set up a drilling site right next to the Miccosukee Reservation. Um, I've spoken a lot um, about this lawsuit and it's still ongoing. Uh, there have been a lot of ups and downs in it. And right now it's been dismissed, but we're trying to file an appeal. Um, this is a photo of me speaking at the uh, FSU Law School about why I'm part of the lawsuit. Um, Delaney Reynolds, as you can see sitting in the corner, she's the name plaintiff on this case. She's set up um, an organization called Miami Sea Rise. She has a newsletter, a website. Um, so I'm so grateful to have surrounded myself with so many uh, great young like leaders. Um, I continue to speak around Florida and I work with a lot of organizations, um, not just to like tell my story, but once again, to bring like indigenous people to the table. Um, I went to Madrid back two years ago for COP25 in COI15. Um, and I was able to speak to Nancy Pelosi because just a few weeks earlier, she had kicked um, a few members of Extinction Rebellion out of her office. And I couldn't believe she was at a climate conference preaching how much we have to do and how it's such a dire issue, but she would refuse to meet with these activists for even an hour just to talk about what she can do and how she can help us. Um, it just felt like such a typical, it's the American way, you know? It doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, they do the same things. They just sit there and they're completely complacent. Um, same side of, the coin, you know, two sides of the same coin, um, which was really disappointing to see. Um, but that's why I'm so glad there's been such an uproar on climate um, in my generation specifically, because I have more hope for the future. Although we don't have much time left to stop or even reverse the effects of climate change, I believe my generation and the young people around me will be able to go into office and sort of set things on a better path than we're going right now. This was a recent photo of the Burnett Oil protest um, where I was able to speak alongside people like Betty Osceola and Houston Cypress. Um, 
And I've just been trying to get much more into uh, these native spaces and be able to be with these communities because I have worked with a lot in the past and I'm going to continue doing that. So it's really such an honor to be able to speak here and share a little bit of my story and just say why I do what I do. Um, and I'm really grateful for all of you listening. And I will put in the website a link to the case. And there are many other cases going on in different states. And there's the federal lawsuit, which might be more well known. It's called Juliana v. Gov. Um, so there's a possibility uh, you might have heard about that. Um, there's one speaker left, and then there will be a Q&A. And yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about me before we got into the questions. Thanks so much, Val Holly. So inspiring and really cool to hear about the, the work that you're doing in uh, the approach to to mitigating climate change that that you engage in. So thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Jasmine Miosh, uh, who you may have heard speak yesterday during the opening ceremonies. And if not, uh, you have an opportunity to hear from Jasmine now. So I'll go ahead and pass it over. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, just real quick, can I get a thumbs up? You guys can hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Um, wow, I feel very strangely about going last because like I was listening to all these amazing presentations and feeling very inspired and kind of just like want to run out and go do some more work. But in the meantime, we'll kind of stay and stay and talk about this. Um, so as she said, my name is Jasmine Niosh. Um, I am a student at the College of Menominee Nation uh, in 2019, I received my natural resources uh, associate degree, uh, which is really cool. I that was the um, first degree uh, in my family, which is which is really awesome. You can see some pictures of me there with my parents and um, with a colleague of mine who's helping me with my uh, with my graduation cap. Um, I am planning to pursue uh, an environmental law um, juris doctorate and environmental science, science and policy master's degree. Uh, hopefully as a dual degree um, after I finish my bachelor's degree in public administration, which I'm working on right now. Um, so the, the purpose of this, of this panel was essentially to kind of like talk a little bit about what we do and just to kind of give you an idea of um, emerging leadership um, in the world of, you know, Indigenous students. Um, and so that's always a really hard question for me, uh, because when people ask me that out and about in the world, they say, like, what do you do? I say, well, I work in climate change, but I do a little bit of everything. And they're like, OK, that's great. But seriously, like, what do you do? And I'm like, I, I do a little bit of everything. Um, so in this particular thing, like, I like to think of the undergraduate experience as kind of almost like a trading wheel session um, that allows students to like really try things out. Um, because when I first came back to college, I knew that I wanted to work um, around issues of climate change, but I wasn't quite sure where I fit in. Uh, so since then, I've worked on projects that involve um, event planning and hosting, um, some policy stuff, uh, grant writing, geographic information systems, database building, archival research, um, some group work around like consensus building and decision making, um, and a few other things as well. And it's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, CMN is one of those environments where it's a really great place for curious students who don't mind getting their hands a little bit dirty. Um, and so that's the exact sort of experience I was looking for. Uh, and that's the experience that I've gotten so far. So uh, the way that most people know me, I think, is through my work with the Sustainable Development Institute. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been focused on the Menominee Theoretical Model of Sustainability, uh, which some people have probably heard a little bit about today um, from either Mike Dockery or from Robin Kimber, who mentioned it briefly. Um, which is a really excellent model. I encourage you to kind of look into it. Um, I kind of think of it as a really great form of contemporary indigenous knowledge that teaches um, indigenous people who want to create positive change how to do that uh, in an environment post-colonization. Um, so definitely check that out. I also do some work around in the uh, Indigenous Planning Summer Institute, which is a fantastic uh, week-long uh, experience that we do. Uh, the last this year and the previous year has been virtual, uh, thanks to COVID-19. 
But essentially what we do is we bring in indigenous students of all levels, uh, lifelong learning, you know, right down to undergrad and even occasionally a high school student will, will be there. Um, and we kind of talk about ways to indigenize planning uh, within our communities to make sure that we're exercising our sovereignty in ways that feel appropriate to us culturally. Um, we also do quite a bit of Earth Day planning. Uh, I'm hoping that you all will stick around for our events at the end of this week. We have Winona LaDuke coming, uh, and I'm really excited about that. In the past, I've also hosted um, panels that talk a little bit about things like um, the importance of being a good relative, uh, talking about some of these invasive species and things like that. Um, and then also a lot of uh, event hosting, virtual and in person. We just had um, Myron Dewey from Digital Smoke Signals, uh, Josh Fox, who uh, made the movie Awake, uh, A Dream from Standing Rock, and then uh, Doug Goodfeather, who's an author, um, come through for a virtual event just this past Friday to talk about uh, approaching climate change as a non-scientist or policymaker. Um, and so that was a really cool like event that we just had. Uh, my other most frequent collaborator is uh, probably the Rising Voices, um, another fantastic conference uh, that deals a lot with uh, like cross-cultural collaborations in climate. Uh, I am a council member there, uh, along with Chris Caldwell. I was actually Chris's alternate for a little while, and I've just kind of like come into my own as a council member. Um, I'm also a member of their COVID-19 working group uh, that looks at um, COVID-19 impacts in indigenous communities um, and kind of like ties that in with some of the lessons learned from the climate crisis. Uh, and oftentimes in these spaces, what I'm there to do is provide a student perspective, uh, which I've become very passionate about making sure that, um, you know, whenever I'm coming into a space that seems intimidating, I'm doing what I can to make sure that I'm opening that up for um, other undergraduates and other, you know, people who are below PhD and master's degree programs. So like start getting engaged with this stuff early, start making sure that they feel comfortable with it. Um, because I feel like a lot of times like those really interesting ideas uh, will come from those kind of voices. So I'm honored to be able to do that. Uh, a lot of my other work um, up here in the top corner, you'll see the, uh, the tribal climate change database, uh, which is a, pr a project I worked with uh, Dr. Kyle, Kyle White, who many of you all probably know. Uh, this was back when he was at Michigan State University. Uh, this is a database that we built from scratch that deals with um, basically just every publicly available tribal climate change plan that we could find, be it adaptation plans or energy development or um, mitigation plans, feasibility studies. And essentially what I did is I went through and coded um, a couple hundred documents for things like you know your standard laundry list, uh, climate change impacts, but then also uh, the social impacts, things like impacts to sovereignty, impacts to language, um, as well as some adaptation strategies uh, that were pretty unique to indigenous communities, such as uh, language revitalization programs and the strengthening of intergenerational uh, relationships. Um, and then also looks at uh, some assessment methods as well um, to kind of see like how people are getting the information uh, that they're using to make the decisions. Uh, so that's at tribalclimatechangedatabase.com um, if people want to take a look at that. Uh, I also do a lot of work with the American Indian College Fund, uh, primarily on advocacy for um, tribal college students uh, just in general. Um, I can't say enough positive things about the tribal college uh, and universities movement. Um, it's an incredibly in, in, like inspiring and um, innovative environment to do this kind of work in. I have gone to um, you know so-called like mainstream universities before, um, and even though the scholarship was very elevated there, it didn't really feel like that exciting, generating new knowledge um, sort of feeling at the undergrad level that I experienced at CMN. So that's uh, I'm really passionate about making sure that other students um, have access to that as well um, and are aware that that opportunity exists. Uh, I also write a blog uh, for the Tribal College Journal uh, called Resilience, it's Stories of Sustainability. Uh, I will be wrapping up a two-year term uh, just this upcoming May. And then um, I, I also have some uh, original research that I'm working on, which is social uh, science research on the importance of sugar maple to modern Menominees in the wake of climate change. Uh, with the idea being that, you know, there's a lot of unknowns about climate change right now. 
I've seen people kind of going back and forth on sugar maple about, you know, what the effects on that are going to be, like how devastating they're going to be and like what that time frame is. But the thing that we do know is that our responsibilities to the land as Menominees and as Indigenous people in general are always going to be there. That's always going to be something. Those relationships and those responsibilities are part of who we are. And so I wanted to look at that and say like, okay, um, for a regular Menominee who's not like a big like policy wonk and science dork like I am, like what does climate change really mean? And I wanted to examine that in the context of um, one really culturally significant species. And so um, I learned a lot about that. I'll, I'll be presenting some of that information out to the community uh, this summer and then hopefully getting that out um, to everybody else. And then I'm also doing uh, some survey on edible plant um, edible plants on the Menominee Forest with the hope of um, getting people to once again sort of think about um, harvesting and foraging um, and turning to these like really beautiful um, food as medicine plants uh, that come from the land that we also come from uh, that go a long way towards nourishing us. Some of the stuff that uh, my good friend Jeff Green had talked about in his presentation. Um, kind of wading into that food, food sovereignty aspect of climate change, uh, which I've so far uh, not delved into as much. Um, so with that, I wanna say, you know, Mashua Wynan, thank you so much. Um, I know I kind of breezed through a lot of this stuff, but feel free to ask questions about uh, whatever is interesting. And I look forward to hearing from the rest of you. Bye. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Oh my gosh, you're doing so much work. All of you really are. Um, it's hard to capture in a 10 minute presentation. <laughs> um, great, well, at this time, um, I think if your computer isn't on gallery view, it might be great to do that so that you can see all of the panelists at the same time. Um, but we, we have a few questions um, from, from the audience that I've taken down here, um, but I wanna start out with kind of a general question for everyone and um, you don't have to respond to every single question, but if you feel really called to, and you know, like I have a great answer, great response, um, you know, I wanna hear from you. So uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm curious if, you know, we heard so much about all of the great work that you're doing and, and that definitely doesn't come without its challenges. And so I'm curious if anyone can kind of talk about, you know, what challenges they face in, in the different fields that they're in um, currently. I'll, uh, I'll tune in. Um, I think I think everybody um, faces the challenges of, of getting funding for certain work. Um, I've been really fortunate to work with USAID and learn how they're able to go after different pots of funding and, and how to work to, to write a, a really well written grant. Um, but nonetheless, I've definitely written my fair share of grants that didn't get funded. And uh, that can be a challenge, but nonetheless, there's a lot of passion in the work that I'm doing because it's so it's such a culturally significant plant species, brown ash. So there's there's plenty of people who are willing to help out and jump on and provide letters of support. Um, so the big cr crux there for for support is is the community. Great, thanks so much, Tyler. I can, I can kind of weigh out on this as well. Um, I touched on it a little bit in my presentation, um, but I feel like one of the things that's really interesting about climate change work is that I feel like it's an inherently interdisciplinary uh, sort of problem to face. Um, and what definitely draws on a lot of different skill sets and knowledges and things like that. I feel like even to just get like a, a basic grasp on it, like you can understand what's going on underneath the hood in terms of like carbon emissions, um, and sea level rise and all that stuff, but like thinking about how it impacts people and how the economics tie into it and the politics that like Val Holly was talking about so so eloquently, I feel like um, to get a really good grasp on that, you need to have like a a pretty decent knowledge set at the very least, like introductory. 
um, the the setback that I see with that is that I feel like academia just doesn't work that way. Um, and while there is a lot of validity to like picking a discipline and then like committing to that, I've also seen a lot of issues um, with people who like end up committing to something and then realizing halfway through that that's not like where they feel like they belong. Um, so I think like finding ways to like be more friendly to people who are are like generalists and stuff like that outside of the tribal college movement, which is um, pretty good at that, uh, I feel as like has been kind of a challenge, um, but a fun one <laughs> at the very least. Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. Yeah, thanks for touching on kind of like the interdisciplinary um, nature of, of climate change work and um, yeah, that it takes it takes all of us to be working on different aspects of this to to really make a difference. Um, Coral, did I see you were unmuting? Sorry if I cut you off. I was just going to echo exactly what what everybody else has said already. Um, the very holistic nature of of climate work is that you're never going to you know be stuck in one section. There's a lot of opportunity to do a lot of different kind of work. Um, as was already stated. So I just wanted to echo that. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, and I think this is a really good segue for, for another question that I'll pose to y'all. And, um, you know, many of you are doing different types of work, right, in order to create change in the climate change and adaptation and mitigation realms. And I'm curious, um, if you could kind of elaborate on the strategies that you engage with to advocate for um, social and, and climate change. Um, strategies that you currently are using or, you know, that you think are effective and maybe want to, um, want to employ. Uh, it's pretty broad, so take it where you will. I um I'll, I'll chime in. I think that when we think about adaptation strategies, you can break them into resistance, transition, or um, going with the change. You know, planning for the future, and I think that uh, it, that's a challenge for natural resource managers to choose one or the other. And um, so I think that the the biggest challenge is working with your community to determine what what's really wanted right and like in the case of emerald ash borer i know i keep going back to that but there's lots of strategies you can do to try and save the ash trees but unless the community is interested in seeing those employed on tribal lands then there's no reason to to try and facilitate that on on tribal lands or figure out if that's something that that could be used um, I think that that's that's something I've learned a lot about working with with you said is that community buy in and, and all things surrounding climate change have been a big, big factor in kind of deciding those implementation actions. I think it's important to look at the the scale of the work that we're doing as well, um, whether it's really community based, uh, you know, state, national, beyond colonial borders and international um, kind of work bringing together, you know, youth and elders and everyone in between um, across tribes and doing that through multiple ways, whether that's uh, summits, events, workshops, um, or having direct conversations with folks about um, you know, funding opportunities or um, mitigation planning and things of that sort. I saw Val Holly's mic go off, so I don't want to jump in before her. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think a big thing is like keeping it intergenerational and also intersectional like making sure that everyone can feel like safe in this space, not necessarily that it has to be like focusing on every different group that's in here fighting against climate change, um, but making sure that there's no like hate among us, you know? Um, 
and a big thing that's really helped because I don't really do like very um official work at least not yet because I'm still a high school senior um so I haven't sort of gotten off the ground with that yet um but one thing that's like really I think changed how uh activism and work is is social media like I like literally looking back like the reason that I'm involved with this uh summit is because Jasmine reached out on Instagram and we met uh through the zero hour conference in Miami and I think it's just been a great way to connect with people over so many different areas like I can really message someone in like Norway right now and like it's so simple and it keeps like of course there are the downsides that like it keeps you really updated and you're like taking in so much information a lot of the times in the stuff that we do it's a lot of bad information um like new bills that were passed that are really terrible or like different natural disasters um but like it also creates a community for all of us where we can all just sort of share that we have this uh, perhaps we have this climate anxiety or we have these worries about the future, um, but just to know that we're not alone in it. Yeah, I definitely want to echo what Val Holly said um, and kind of like touched on there. Um, I've kind of been moving around that like science communication, um, like tangentially activism space for a, for a while. Um, and I'm finding that one thing that's like really important maybe as a strategy um, is just like trying to find ways to give people hope, you know, really trying to come at these things from places of love. Because I find that with a lot of environmental topics, um, you know, this stuff can be really draining. There's a lot of people that I work with um, in these different fields who are watching, like, for example, like Emerald Ash Borer, like take over their forests or like watching these cultural practices that they love for be threatened. Um, and it can be very draining. Um, when you start to kind of like collect all of that information um, to the point where like for some people have told me that it can be kind of paralyzing, um, which is not good. <laughs> like we're we're in, we're at this point now where we should be trying to like save the things that we love. And the only way that we can really do that is if we like actually do understand the things that we love and why we love them um, and really keeping that in the back of our minds at all times. So I find that like whenever I'm like working on a like a written piece or like speaking to um, the community or group of people, I always like to re-emphasize that part of like, if these are the things in life that are important to you, if this land matters to you, then you can fight for it. Like we don't have to like let these things just fall to the wayside because of all so many interests who are against us on this. Like we can do something and we should. Um, and I think that's been kind of my, my go-to strategy the last few years. Thanks so much, everyone, for sharing. Um, Y'all are getting some good praise in the in the chat, so definitely check it out when you are not speaking. Um, yeah, one, I think this like segues into, again, y'all are doing a great job of just kind of going through these questions, but yeah, what, what sustains you in this type of work, you know? Um, climate adaptation, mitigation, activism, all of, all of these realms of climate change work can be exhausting and can lead to a lot of burnout. And I'm curious if you, yeah, what sustains you in this work? What strategies do you have for staying grounded and focused and, and to make sure that you're caring for yourself and, and those around you uh, to continue to engage with this type of work? A lot of the times, like, I will have to take a break from all of it because it will get really overwhelming, especially when I was a kid. It worries me sometimes when I hear, like, little kids talking about climate. It's like, oh, my God, don't get too into it. Like, I'm glad that people care, but it's, like, that's a lot to take in um, that, like, people are really deciding whether you have a future or not, you know? Um, but I think a great thing um, that I have that a lot of people don't is that, like, and I guess we can all understand is that we have our reservations. Like it's such a beautiful place to be able to go and decompress. Um, and like being in the Everglades, being where I grew up, it's really great. I have to get off of social media. Um, but when I come back, it's always the people around who do the same type of work who always help me bounce back. Um, Cause like 
like I said earlier, we're not alone. We're doing this all together and it's not gonna be an easy fight. Um, so it's okay to be able to step back and breathe for a second and come back because we all have to make sure that we're okay mentally so we can fight to help everyone else. Yeah, I'm kind of, kind of in the same boat too. Um, so I don't have children yet. I'm planning to like probably after my Juris Doctorate, but I do have a niece um, who's just like the center of my own world, my whole world and becoming like a fantastic scholar in her own right. Um, and like thinking about her and like the world that I want her to have, like has been the thing that has kept me going, I think. Like definitely the thing that started it for sure. Um, and I find that like the thing that kind of like gets me through it, like I am much like a lot of academia and that I'm like, I'm often telling people that they need to take care of themselves. But then, like for myself, like, you know, I'm like, ah, I could stay up another hour and like keep reading or something like that. Um, but I find that just like having good solid comrades to work with um, in this um, that I can talk with and like experience these things. And like, when we do get a setback of like, you know, something that's like super colonized that happens within um, an institution that we weren't expecting that from, or, you know, something like that having people like that who are also there with me going through the same thing, um, who can offer advice or even just support or, you know, you know, a couple laughs really just like some jokes. Like that's the thing that like refreshes me, um, and wants me to get back in there. Yeah, definitely having that, that sense of community, even, uh, virtually now has been, uh, really important to continue the work. Um, that we're all doing. I also try to spend more time in nature. Um, when I'm stressed out, I've been hiking and camping a lot lately, which has been a huge relief too. Um, but in the times where, you know, you're stuck in the grind, just really remembering why you got into the work in the first place, remembering why you're passionate about that. Um, and having that, that solidarity with other folks who are, um, equally passionate about that work or dedicated to, you know, over overcoming all of the barriers that we're facing in climate work and, and beyond that. Yeah, I, I agree too. It has a lot to do with the, the community that you're working in. I feel like uh, as I've focused in and gotten closer and closer to the, the specific role in which I'm working in my research or with USET, I find a group of people who, if I'm seeing an issue and I am talking about it and it sounds like I'm getting upset or, or I have like a, I, I seem like it's a, I'm, I'm all doom and gloom. They'll step in and say, um, you know, there's this side of, you know, that this is a positive aspect of this issue or, and that's, that's always good to have those type of people um, to kind of, realign you and, and make you think um, what everyone here on the panel just just talked about what what's driving the reason why you started this in the first place. So I think it is a lot of times the, the group you're working with, but definitely nature too, I like to uh, get in the woods, hunt or, or fish. And hopefully your background makes you feel immersed in nature constantly. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I got it on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks everyone for those responses. It's really, yeah, those are really um, important uh, experiences uh, that each of you have and are sharing. And um, oh my gosh, we're actually running out of time here. And so I want to get to a few questions that have been asked by the um, by the audience. And so Coral, you have one specifically. Um, are you able to share more details on decolonizing federal land study? And also this person was wondering if you are considering graduate school. <laughs> I was just typing in the chat to respond to that because I thought we were gonna run out of time. So I'm excited yeah. I can just chat about it real quick. Yeah, we um, Yeah, originally that paper started as um, a paper about decolonizing nat national park management. Um, and then we kind of broadened it out to uh, federal lands in general, um, or public lands in general. Um, and that was just a joint effort between myself, um, 
a, a, another grad student here at Oregon State and uh, two other students out at Penn State, all indigenous women um, or indigenous folks who are really passionate about this kind of work and focusing on uh, recreation and land use um, and tribal sovereignty. Uh, that's going through a review process, so I can't share it or anything really about it yet, unfortunately. Um, but I'm hoping for updates within the next couple months on the uh, the status of that effort. And then I am hoping to look into grad programs. As I mentioned, I'm a first generation college student. Um, this is the furthest <laughs> anyone in my family has got, um, and I'm trying to weigh the you know pros and cons of of doing more school, um, it, it can be pretty exhausting as um, a lot of folks here on the call know, um, but I'm looking for something that's a little more specific um, with indigenous perspectives um, because we all get a, a very good grip on the, you know, Western perspectives on, on management and environmental work, but really grounding in, in traditional knowledge and, um, Indigenous ways of knowing is something that I feel I could further a lot in grad school, um, and there are some opportunities for that out there. So Great. Thanks for that question. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, Coral. Yeah, and one, another question that I'd like to ask um, from Rachel. Rachel says um, that they're working with a group to develop a climate action field school all around Lake Superior for the summer and specifically meant to have participants from 18 to 30 years old. Any advice for us in our planning? Show people some pictures of that beautiful Lake Superior, like sunset, sunrise, and lakeshore. Like you'll have them flocking to you just, just on that basis alone. Um, but then, yeah, also just like, um, I think it's good to have like some peer leaders in there too, uh, to make people feel comfortable. Um, there are certainly some fantastic, um, folks out there, like around the, like, you know, Bay area, uh, like young folks who are doing fantastic work. Um, but I do find that that kind of like makes people feel more comfortable once they're there. I think that that's a, that's a good comment jasmine i think when you have a an event where it's kind of like a destination um talking about the, the specific impacts to that area um allow people to connect with the place that they're they're visiting and even if it's virtual if they're helping host it i'm not sure what the situation is with that event but we can you can still do some virtual versions of of sharing the the story of the area that everyone's trying to tune into Great, thanks for those suggestions, y'all. Um, all right, we have time for um, one more question, I think. And yeah, I'd like to leave the audience with, you know, any advice or resources that y'all have uh, for other emerging leaders that are engaging in, in climate change work um, or like final thoughts, Any anything that, you think is really relevant and uh, you wish someone would have told you uh, as you kind of took on this, this pathway. I know that some advice I got early on was to, to take every opportunity that comes your way because you never know, you know, how, how it'll impact you or how much you'll end up enjoying something or what new opportunities it can open. Um, but in the same token, I will also say to know your limits <laughs> um, and, and know when something is, is too much. Um, but trying new things and different experiences is definitely what led me to the place that I'm at today. So as long as it's um, pushing your, your boundaries, but not too much, <laughs> and you have the capacity to do that work. Um, without losing why you got into it in the first place. Um, that's something that I would pass on to others as well. I would say um, to kind of like build off of that, like just get into the habit of saying yes to things like that you like really do actually want to do. 
um, you know, my very first internship, I didn't feel qualified to do it at all. I was reading the description. I was like, you know, I'm smart. I'm not that smart. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. That's for grownups. Um, and then once I got in there, I was like, oh yeah, this hundred percent is me. I just like, didn't have, you know, I was like trying to be like too humble or whatever, um, you know, euphemism we want to use for like imposter syndrome at the time. Um, but the more I started saying yes to things and like discovering my own capacity and like what I could do for my community, um, the more passionate and more confident and like, quite frankly, better at these things that I got. Um, and the second thing would be find yourself a good mentor. Um, you know, don't be afraid to like find somebody you see who's like doing something really good and then just ask them questions, you know, maybe follow them around a little bit. I made a joke that I was kind of just like most of my work was actually just following Chris Caldwell around from like conference to conference. <laughs> and like there's a, a grain of truth to that, but also like him giving me some some good coaching, um, you know, giving me a push if I really if I actually did need it. Um, and then just kind of like showing me how to be this indigenous person um in a Western science led world was crucial. And so I would encourage that for anyone who can. Yeah, I think saying uh, saying yes is a an important thing. I I also started in the BIA Pathways program, and my first internship opportunity was not where I initially applied, and it was going to have to make me pick up my stuff and move uh, quite a ways away from my family. And I wasn't excited about that, and then initially I I was going to turn it down and try to find something else, and you know maybe that would have worked out fine too, but uh, ended up being probably if I were to answer that question that was posed at the beginning, that internship is where I probably got my feeding um, in forestry. And so I'm really glad I took the jump or leap of faith, I suppose, to go all the way to Moose River, Maine. Now I go there sometimes just for to go fly fishing. <laughs> I think a big thing um, for me, of course, I agree with like uh, being around people, being able to ask questions and everything, um, but like also don't doubt yourself while you do it. Because for like all the years that I've done what I've uh, what I've been doing, um, I would always have these like thoughts in the back of my mind, like, oh, I'm not smart enough, I'm not knowledgeable enough on this to be able to do this, or even like I'm not native enough. Sometimes like. That was a big thing, especially because like I am uh, like my mom's white um, and like I don't know my language fluently. Um, so like don't let these things like get to you um, and just like keep moving forward. And that saying yes thing, that's definitely why I'm here today because um, if I hadn't said yes and agreed to certain things, I wouldn't be on that lawsuit. I definitely wouldn't be speaking here today. Um, and of course, it's great to always like be a supporter and like be back there protesting. And I do it myself still a lot. Um, like I'll step back. I won't always have to speak at these events. I go and I attend a lot of them just as like a viewer. Um, but like, if you have the ability, like share your story. Um, Cause like it might shock you how it will inspire others. Yeah, thanks so much for those last words, Val Holly. Uh, I think you leave us with such a hopeful note, um, you know, that it's about sharing our stories and inspiring one another and uh, building community within within this work to, you know, build momentum and, um, you know, to keep things, keep things um, lighthearted and, and also be fighting for the things that we want to see and be in the world. So, um yeah a bit I heard I, I heard I saw some uh applause applause clapping hands for for the panelists and I just want to thank each of you for for your experience and your time and your willingness to share about your experience it's it's so wonderful and yeah this has been such a great session and um I hope so this is the last session for today and tomorrow um, we'll pick up with more breakout sessions uh, in the morning. So, yes, thanks to everyone. And, um, 
Yeah, so grateful for you all joining.